Can you find it? We can cut it off if you want to. Uh, I think we're okay. Hey, could you just count to like five for me? Yeah. One. Just count to five. One. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. I'm ready. Ready to run, sir. All right, sir. You ready for me to walk ready over? To Family, as we before we get started here, and I believe you want me to start with this one right here. This is my family I'm on my mother's side. This is my mother here in the top, and this is all of her brothers and sisters, except this one right here in this lady's lap is, an, is a nephew. The rest of them are all children of this, of my grandmother and granddaughter, sitting right here in the front. And uh, grandmother's holding the youngest baby. And, Granddad is holding next to it over there. Okay, now we go start again. And when Let me show you something about my family as we get into, get into the going along. This picture right here is a picture of my mother's family. And my granddaddy was raised an orphan by uh, foster parents. And I don't know much about his people, he, although he was raised. My grandmother was born uh, in Carroll County, uh, Lizzie Carter. And my granddaddy, uh, my granddaddy, I think maybe he might have come from Camel County, uh, uh, and, but my grandmother was born here in this county, in Carroll County. And this is a family, and this is my mother right up here on the top, and this is all of her brothers and sisters, except this one right here is a nephew. And uh, he had 14 children, him and her did. Two are not in this picture, but he had 14 children. And then my granddaddy married again and had one child by his last wife. So he was a father of 15 children, my grandmother was a father of 14 children. And uh, seven each, seven boys and seven girls. And uh, th th then you said, come down here. And then this right here is a picture of my daddy's mother and father. This, pi this, pi this, this picture was taken, I presume, about 1875, around that one, because it was several years before. She died, and, she, and grandmother died in 1903, so it must have been taken about 19, 1875. And uh, then this picture here is a picture of myself and my oldest brother, taken in 19 and 10. And uh, we was in a buggy, and uh, uh, you can recognize the buggy sitting here. And I was a little mean when here trying to shake the buggy down. And uh, that was my brother over there next to him, next to it. This picture. Right here is my mother and father about two years before my daddy died, which was taken about 1947. That was my daddy and mother in about 1947. And uh, he died at 69, prostrate cancer. Cancer killed him. And this, this, uh, this right here is my oldest grandson and, uh, and we, when he was in the service. He was born in 19 and 28, and this picture was taken about, I don't know, I guess about, well, I wouldn't say just about 15 years ago in here, something like that. And uh, he, that's my oldest grandson. This picture right here is me and my wife on our 50th anniversary. That was about four years before she died. And, uh, and that was, this picture was taken in 19 and, and uh, 78. About her death, yeah, okay. Her death, my wife worked in, we, she, she was like I. She come from East Newland, but if we was left uh, on the count of uh, being sympathizers, said with the organized labor, they, we, we lost out, as some of them said. They black listers. But at Hogansville, we did get a job, and she got a job in what they call the asbestos division of the mill. And we heard it was dangerous, so we later on, uh, we got her out of it, and then she went back later on because times got bad, and she had to get in, had to look like she had to make a living. She got in, so she worked about 25 years altogether in asbestos. And from that, she dipped, developed asbestosis and died in 1982 uh, with that asbestosis, which was a horrible to death. It was a 
you see people gradually smothering to death. They're just gradually smothering to death, and there's nothing you can do about them. No matter what you do, you can't do anything about it. Now, I've got her out at night and even had the police follow me, ride her around all over town because she thought maybe she, I mean, she did, could seem like get her breath a little better when the air was blowing in her face, and we would be riding sometime all night long. But anyway, I have seen the time whenever I'd go in here and I'd go in the room where she's at, and I have picked her up because she was very light. She got down to 70, uh, 59 pounds before she died. And I have got her plumb out in the yard before she'd catch her breath. And, uh, you know, you're never ready to give your companion up. But when you see him suffer what I saw him, it is a relief to see him get out of that suffering. So I was in, it, it relieved whenever she got out of all that suffering. And then we uh, go down here to this bottom part here. This is a picture of my oldest son. My only, only son, for the oldest child and my youngest child. That's my baby over here on this side. This was, this, he was born in 1931, I mean 19, yeah, 1921. And she was born in 19, no, 31. She was born, 19, wait a minute, I'll get it right directly. He was born in 1930, January 1930, and she was 39, in 39. So there was a, in December of 39, so there was t almost 10 years between their two, their, their two, uh, birth but all three of my children was born in the same decade decade he come in the first and she went out just as it went out this here is a picture of my uh, oldest grandson and uh, a great grandson oldest great grandson and uh, he's uh, he, and this he, this picture was taken about 10 years ago and uh, he was playing with his toys there this picture right here is a picture of my wife's mother and father and this picture it must have been taken about 1901 well you don't see him you can see it, it, my granddaddy I got a little a baby it had a little a baby sitting in his lap right there and that baby was born in 1900 so you can see how old he was so I'd say it's about 1901 and, and that picture was taken and uh this picture right here is a picture of my mother at a Christmas time that we had in at my house we used to have they used to say you never had been at Christmas till you was at, at the Duncan's house. But my, my, that was about uh, taking about, about, three, about four years before Mother died. So I'd say around 1970. This picture was taken about 1970. And uh, that, uh, my mother was a great woman, and I think, I, I think about her a lot. But that, that's about all that we can see about how I've got on the family pictures. And uh, this over here is the enlargement of them. My wife's mother, mother and daddy of this small picture right here. This is an enlargement of this small picture right over here. But you notice the baby is left out of it. They left the baby out so it wouldn't, you know, it'd just be a picture of her mother and father in, 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 that, in that. So that, 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 that's sort of the history of my family. Uh, let me show you something about my family here. This picture right up here that we see right up here is a picture of my mother's uh, family. My mother's family. And uh, uh, let me show you something about my family. And it, this picture right here that you see up here at the top, that's a picture of my mother's family. They was raised on the farm back in them days. Uh, you know, when a child got old enough to farm, I'd work on the farm. They went to work in the field. They quit school to go to work in the field. But they was raised farmers. And my, and my family on my daddy's side was raised farmers. And then this picture, this picture right here is me and my brother taken in 19 and 10, which was a picture of, uh, of us sitting in a buggy. That's the mode of transportation at the time we sat in the buggy. This picture over here is my mother and father in the latter years of life, just before, the, before they died. And then this one down here, uh, this one right here, is a picture of me and my wife on our 50th anniversary, whenever we was, uh, had been married 50 years. That was about four, four and a half years before she died. And uh, I believe he said that would be, be, be out all you wanted. Now, uh, tell us, take up the picture of your wife again and tell us how she died. Okay, this picture right here, you notice my wife, she was pretty frail there, pretty uh, uh, sickly. She had died with asbestosis. She worked about 25 years in a plant where they had asbestosis. They told us at that time it was perfectly safe to work in it, but she worked there about 25 years. Of course, she lived about 8 or 10 years after that. But she developed that asbestosis, and she gradually went down, 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 until she got down to 59 pounds, 
and uh, she literally smothered to death. There's just no way that she could uh, uh, live like she was. And it was a relief to me whenever she passed away because I saw she was out of that suffering. And uh, that's about the limit of my family there that I think you wanted to know about. Did you want this and held yeah. up? No, 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 no. Uh, that sign, I will say a little, give us a little close up. Yeah, that sign. Uh, is that okay? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, go back to the other picture. By the way, everyone in that family is dead except the baby, uh -huh. that in his lap. Yeah. Now that's my mother, that's it, right up at the top up there. Then uh, go in for a, if you can, for a, about a, a three shot on the mother. That's fine. Okay. Good. Okay. Now, are you in that at all? No, sir. Of course, I said before you. I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, my mother wasn't even married then. Okay. Yeah. okay. Maybe, maybe um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about his mom and uh, that he was raised on a farm with her until they left, George. How was that now? Were you raised on a farm? Yes, sir. I was raised on a farm till I was uh, about fourteen years old. Did you get that? Fine. Okay. And talk about this now. Yeah, this this is a picture of my, me and my oldest brother there, and uh, that's me and so that trying to shake the buggy down on this side, and that's my oldest brother. He he departed about three years ago, but uh, I'm the oldest one in the family now, and but that's me that that now on this side. Okay. I want to say that again, but this this is me in 190. Oh, that that's me in 1910. When this picture was taken, had they already started? Coming well, out? yeah, they had already started them, but they wasn't as plentiful as they got later on in years, you know, because uh, they were some of them. Now, you take one of the mills in Hoganville was built in 1899. And so I know that these, I mean, in Newton, I don't think it was quite that old, but they were very near, very low in the 1900s. What did your grandpa think about cotton mill work? Well, the folk, in them days, they just, Cotton mill people was looked down on. They just didn't think any, any they thought that was the trash of the world, cotton mill folks, you know. Everybody thought it. And uh, But in, whenever we first went to cotton mill, I was there, they thought, well, hey, I don't want you to go down there and work in that old cotton mill and not thought of it. But when we got down there and got in it, we found out they was made up of farmers like us that had come in off the farm, and most of them was, you know, just good c country farm people, and they'd just been forced out on account of the bull weevils and things. But at the, at the time it, that picture was made, and the time that the cotton mill first started, they was looked down on by everybody. Okay, and we're going to get that on camera as well. All right, so I want you to tell me about how you got into the cotton mill. Okay, and uh, well, I, in, we, in 1923 was the year we left uh, the farm. Well, and sorry. Stop, I just want to make sure that you look at me as much as you can. Okay, you okay. Okay, start again. In 1923 was the year that we left Cotton Mill. We farmed that year, but boy, we was run us out. How come us to get a beaver farm? We had 35 acres in cotton. We only got 400 pounds of lint cotton. And uh, we had nothing else to do except get out of farming. 
and that's what drove us to the cotton mill. Of course, to start with, we went to Newnan, and we worked a short while in a hosiery mill in Newnan. And then we went. I went to mill number one, number one in Newnan and worked there about 18 months. And then we went to East Newnan down there. And at that time, you know, people wouldn't thought very much of in cotton mill work, and they, our family really ridiculed us much for going. But we went on anyhow, and we found out we could make a good living there, and, and so we just let, we, we, when we went, we were just going to do that, we'd do better. But we, they'd done better, I'd done better there for 51 years. <laughs> I raised my family in the cotton mill, and, I, and I'm proud of it. I think it was honorable work, it's honorable work that we done. But anyway, that the bull weave was the cause of us going in the cotton mill. Why do you think people look down on uh, you know, people of the cotton mill? Talk about that. I, I just, uh, that's one thing that I never have understood uh, why that they did, but it was just one thing sorry, it did. Sorry, start again, just saying why they did look down on the cotton mill people. Okay, uh, why they looked down on cotton mill people, that I never have fully understood. It was a, it, back whenever I was a kid, a uh, small boy, there they were several classes of people and each one of them was, didn't want to associate with the other class. And cotton mill people was counted in the eyes of the public of about the lowest class people they were. They were sort of like Bible days with hurt sheep herders. They was counted the lowest class people they were. But we found out that that wasn't true when we went to cotton mill because we found lots of good, honest people there. It was just good people that went, had, was forced in the cotton mill work. So that was a means of us going to the cotton mill was because of I couldn't make a living nowhere else, Harley, and that's about the only place you could make a living. Tell about what you did and what you got paid and what it was like working in the mill. Okay. When I first went in the mill, we was uh, we had uh, I went in went to work 60 hours a week, and I made five dollars and 18 cents for the first 60 hours that I worked. And uh, we went on. I I went to work in, in sweeping in a in in the twister room of number one mill in Union. And at that time, they didn't even have any water in the mill. They had wells on the outside. And I had to, being a sweeper, I had to tote the water. So I'd go out there and get a bucket of water and bring it in. And we had a, little, a wooden lid we'd put drop down over to keep the lint out of it. But you went there and drank water out of it. Everybody was a dipper, just like the old time was. We had a dipper, and everybody would go there and dip him some out and drink his water. And uh, that was before they ever put them in. And uh, then whenever, in 1925, that is 1923 that I'm talking about, 1925 then, we moved to mill number two, and I went in the carding department, and I went sweeping in the carding department. But I learned to run the machines in my spare time. Cause everybody had spare times in. The, the cotton mill was a very easy place to work. You didn't have anything much to do for them. Uh, I'd say the first 10 years we was in the cotton mill, it was just, you know, you could run three jobs the same like you were running. But then after that, they began to tighten down on them, begin to give wages raised, and, and, uh, and they had to, improve and get more production for what they was doing. And at the time that I was talking about before then, when you went in the mill, you got the top salary, which was, say, 11 or $12 a week, and you never did go no higher than that because there wasn't no such a thing as inflation. Everything was just run year in, year in, year out the same way. It was up and down a little on the account of supply and demand, but there was no inflation to count uh, back whenever I was a kid. Do you remember when it uh the New Deal came in at yeah. Roosevelt and the change? Yeah, I remember the New Deal coming in. I know uh, it uh, It was in, in 1932 he was elected and he'd taken office on March the 20th, 1933. And then in July after that, he had done met with the cotton mill people and talked them into everything to uh, eight hours a day. And boy, that was tremendous when we worked eight hours a day. But the mill we worked at at East Noonan, they worked seven hours a day and then they wanted to keep that sixth day in there, so they went back and worked five hours on Saturday. We worked seven hours a day through the week, and boy, it looked like we had so much time off, we didn't know what to do with it. And, uh, and we was getting $12 a week, where we was getting seven fifty before we went in there. So we, we were living in high cotton then. We had, we had things made in them days, and uh, it was just wonderful, we thought, then, you know. Then what happened? Well, then, uh, then uh, they... they, they they got uh, their organization become, come in and begin to organize. And the biggest trouble that the organized labor had was they 
happened to pick the wrong kind of leaders. It didn't know didn't know what to do and how to do it, and and it, it been a different matter altogether. But anyhow, they called wild strike strikes and one thing to another, you know, and so that set the whole community almost. It wasn't in the mill in the union against the union. That made brother against brother and sister against sister, whatever you want to call it, you know, and. That was a that was a terrible, terrible disaster. It was a tragedy that think it, it split people up like it did. Because we, in East Noon we were just a loving family before then, and we finally got back to it again in later years. But what what were they organizing for? Well, it was main thing it was for was to to see that they couldn't discriminate on you. Now, if you if you walked in the mill, and uh, and your overseer immediately over you. If he didn't like you, he could just fire you and let you go. And organized labor was something other to stop that discriminating against people and doing one thing or another, one of the things. And then another thing was a little, it was all better wages, you know. And of course, they never shortened the hours because that was all, they had already down to eight hours, you know. But on account of that uh, discriminating, and they, I think was the main thing it, it, they wanted to come in the union for. What about the stretch out? The what? The stretch out. The stretch out, well now, uh, Ethan Noonan Mill, they never did have that. It, they, they would just put more work on people and just automatically. Now that stretch out, I don't know if he'd ever come into Noonan Mill because in 1935 after the strike I had to leave there. And I went to Bibb Manufacturing Company which has the workload. And, uh, they, they, and uh, they, they, uh, they just give you just about all you could do, that's all it was to it. But they paid pretty good on it, and, uh, and I was making. I went up there and went to making twenty-five dollars and a half for forty for forty-eight hours, which I thought was tremendous money. I thought it was the best money. I, well, it was the best money I'd ever made, and I still say I had good times long in it. Okay, now go back and tell us about the union, how you got in the union, and what happened. Well, uh, they they uh, they first said that they wasn't going to fall out with people about union. You could go. You could go to. You, 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 of course, organize the thing. They come around and come to your house and talk to you. And, and if you was easily persuaded, they'd persuade you to go into it, you know, and tell you how much better things are going to be. So we got in the union on on the grounds of them people coming in there. And uh, as I said, I joined the union, but I never did participate in none of the things. And they 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 didn't object to people having meetings to them. And so they, but they did put what we call would call in ordinary in the government spies. It went in there and. and to catch out and carry back to the company, everything was told in the meetings, you know, and therefore that made it more uh, suffocated, you know. And then after they had that wildcat strike, they just refused to work. Anybody was in, in it, and in them, and they abandoned them for all the mills around. And there's no way you could get, uh, you could, you know, get a job. And uh, so it, 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 that's the reason why it, they, President Roosevelt bought that land down at Pine Mountain and developed them farms down there so people could. And there was a lot of people that's hoped by it. A lot of them still, family still living right there in Pine Mountain now. But the amazing thing was he'd done that with his own money. That wasn't government money he'd done that with. Now, back to when you joined the union, uh, tell us how you signed up and then what happened. Did you have to leave the village or did you have to get out of the house or what after the, when they found out? Well, uh, they, they, they didn't actually make them get out right then until after the strike. In other words, when you join it, they, they, they was against you and everything, but you didn't have to move and things until after they had the strike. And then after, after the strike, strike, they fired and they got wouldn't work anymore. Well, I, I, I stayed there uh, maybe a year, a year and a half after they, the strike was over. And they didn't force me to get out or nothing, but they didn't, and didn't charge me no rent. I just lived there. But uh, they, they didn't, uh, in other words, I didn't have no job, and I couldn't live there without a job, so it meant that you had to leave the place. But more or less, it's like coming off the farm going there. You had to do it for survival purposes. Do you remember any of the leaders of the strike? Yeah, uh, Mutt Jones was a, one of the main leaders of it. He lived there in Union for years and years, and, and he was the main leader of it, and he was a president of the Union Lodge, and he was a, he was the main one. And I don't remember who his workers was, but he was the head, head of the Union there in Union. Talk about Mutt Jones. Well, Mutt Jones was a, I don't know, he was a fellow that just, I would say we would call them bums now. Didn't want to get out and do no work, nothing, and him and his wife didn't get along, and his wife worked and supported him in one thing or another. So that's where I was saying they chose the wrong kind of people for leaders. But he did talk people into following, you know, you can talk people into following you if you, 
if you'll get out there and try, you know. Any way you want to, you can talk somebody into following you. Why do you think you joined the union? Well, for that purpose, like I was talking about, so the overseer wouldn't have a chance to could run you off and, and one thing like that and another, and maybe better work, uh, uh, working conditions. And one thing, another thing was that we had no air conditioning. It was sweatshops and things like that. And, they, you know, that we thought maybe we would have better places to work in, cooler places to work in, and some of the mills later on did put the air conditioning in, but some of them haven't done it till yet. So, uh, Talk about your wife in the mill. About what? Your wife. My wife was a wine tender. She worked in the wine room all the way, and she went to work, <clears throat> I think, younger than I was, very, very young. And uh, she, and that's all she ever done was working in the, in the wine room. She had us wind it on balls, young, young balls of yarn, you know. and. I don't see it with any boasting and bragging, nothing like that, but she was a top-notch worker. She was really good. Everywhere she went, she gave satisfaction in her work. And uh, a lot of them folks that you interviewed, like Opal, Mike Michael and them, they worked out in the wine room, too, with her, you know. She knows all of them. Could you tell us about her re relationship to the union? Well, she she never did she never would take no part in it. She wouldn't, she wouldn't join it because she had a brother-in-law that was a, a fixer, and, and he was against, I mean, he was section in, and he was against it, and therefore she sided with them. So she never did take no part. That's where I was telling about sometimes it turned families against members of the family, you know, and one thing and another, things doing like that. But she never did participate in the union at all. How did you talk to her about that? Well, we just never did discuss it because we know it would be a, a different opinion, and we didn't want no argument about it. We just didn't discuss it. Did you go to any of the meetings? I went to a few of them, not to too many of them. I was say, I went to a few of the meetings. You went to a few of the meetings, but uh, not too many of them, and I didn't go to too many, but a few of them I did attend. And uh, we had a hall that they met up in Union, and we'd meet maybe twice a month, something like that, and tell what, how it was going on, and one thing or another. Uh, did, could you talk about the people that came from Atlanta? Uh, you, you, uh, no, because them was National Guard had come and got them, you know, and they were, they weren't actually from Atlanta. They're just from all over the state, but the troop was in Atlanta, you know. You're talking about the one that come and got them. Well, they just come down there. There was the National Guard, and they just come down. Of course, they was obeying orders, you know. And uh, they, uh, they had guns, but they tell me none of them was loaded. Now I don't know. They tell me none of them was loaded, but they didn't. They wouldn't have needed them because there wasn't no. No way of no violence are happening there because nobody didn't have anything out there to have any violence with other than the fist or something like that. So it would, couldn't have been no real violence out there, but they wanted to break the strike, you know. And, and as they said, some of them said Sunday, Herman Tal I mean, Gene Talmadge was running for governor and he was re running for re-election. And he told me, he made the speech and said, well, said if you uh, stay cool, you've got a friend in the governor's chair. But whenever they, after we got in there, that we lost a friend in the governor's chair. <laughs> so he sent troops out in less than about two hours after he was uh, known he was really elected. And back then, it was a primary all it was, but back then in Georgia, whenever you let win the primary, you was, that was it. Because there's nobody run against, they, <clears throat> nobody run against you in the general election at all because Georgia was strictly Democrat. Well, all the South was, you know. They call them the, the solid South, a, a safe South, you know. Did you ever go out on any of the trucks to try to close down other mills? No, sir. Never did do that. Uh, the flying squads, mostly, most of them, as I said before, come from Hoganville. And we come out on them trucks and to scare them down. And they would, have, they would have sticks, and whenever they'd get out there, they'd form two lines out here and hold them sticks up like Mason used to and let make the... Boston things march out under them sticks, you know. But now that's the nearest that violence had ever come, and he never did strike anybody or no, 